Hey there, it's Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. For this episode, we've got more of a channel update for you. I'm going to be doing an unboxing of the new oscilloscope that I just got. But uh, first, we're going to talk about some of the things I have going on. And then after we see that scope, we got a little extra bonus to show you. And I think you'll like to see that as well. So let's get right to it. Uh, first of all, if you haven't seen, I've got a podcast now. In fact, I put a video of that recording of that podcast right here on my channel. But obviously, the real way that you'd want to experience it in most cases would be to listen to it on your preferred device. And you can do that by subscribing to the podcast at www.retrobrewhouse.com. And it's available, of course, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, all the big guys. It's up there. Just uh, search for it, or you can go right to the website, and uh, you could even get that raw RSS feed, which I'm sure a lot of you folks like to do, and just uh, put it in whatever sort of player you want. And so the first episode that uh, came out this month was just really of an introduction. So it introduces me and the panel on the show and just talking about our backgrounds and how we got into the hobby of retro homebrew development. And of course, mainly uh, we're, we're looking at games here, but it does span a bit more than just the games. It's a lot of the tooling that goes into making those games. And for some of these newer retro machines like the Commander X-16, really having to build out this sort of uh, environment in which to create these games because there's no development tools at all. So we're you know building libraries, building uh, utilities that run either on your host development platform or on the system itself. And so there's there's a lot that needs to be done when you're creating this entirely new system to work on. So we talk a lot about that and talk about why that's the sort of thing we'd want to do these days. Uh, why would you do retro development now when you could develop on a modern computer or mobile device which have limitless potential? Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the real crux of the issue there. And I think we have a, a good answer for that. And that will set us up for future episodes, which are generally going to be focusing on individual platforms, at least for this first season. And uh, first up will, of course, be the Atari 2600. We're going to be going in roughly chronological order in terms of uh, systems that, of course, are very popular for gaming. But uh, we're going to be covering other systems, too, that had productive uses as well. But it's always going to be systems that had uh, have a strong gaming legacy to them. And so, of course, the 2600, it was the first massively popular video game console that had interchangeable ROMs. And the, you just can't say enough about how important the 2600 was and how big the 2600 homebrew community is, despite the fact that it's an extremely difficult computer. Because uh, it is a computer. It's an extremely embedded computer. And it's so extremely difficult to make it do much of anything. Uh, and so we're going to talk all about that and have uh, lots of great reminiscences of playing the Atari 2600 and then the voyage of discovery of learning how to program for it. And there's a, a lot of really interesting things. The, the capabilities that people get out of the 2600, especially in these new homebrew games, it, it's really quite amazing. And we're going to share all of that with you. Hopefully you've also seen on the channel the 16-bit Battle Royale, which just started that first round with a greatly historic but maybe not so powerful uh, Texas Instruments TI-994A, which was technically a 16-bit computer, even though it very much seems like an 8-bit computer based on its performance. And uh, of course, also the IBM PC, starting with the original 5150 PC, and then uh, moving ahead to the uh, final generation of uh, strictly 16-bit IBM PCs, which was the 5170 PC-AT. And uh, of course, that ran a 286 processor. This was really the end of the line in terms of strictly 16-bit IBM uh, personal computers. And then, of course, there were many clones of that original AT. And, and that, that architecture, of course, has evolved into the computers we have today. Uh, but we're really going to cut that off there in terms of the PC line. 
And uh, now we're going to branch out into these other computers like the Apple Macintosh 128K, the very first Mac, which is <laughs> unlike the PC, it does not have this really continuous uh, legacy of uh, compatibility up to these modern uh, Apple Silicon ARM-based M1 processors. Those are uh, of an extremely far cry from that original Apple Mac that had a 68,000 and only had 128K and it was hardly usable at all, <laughs> 128K. But it did have a basic interpreter that worked with it. And so we're gonna see how that works. Of course, we're gonna to have to make a few allowances for the Mac because uh, back then Macs didn't have color and you did though have pretty good resolution. So we can get away with dithering on there. So yeah, we'll have different dithering patterns for the Mac, kind of like how we did different dithering patterns for the NES when we had that little one-off show. Uh, but for the others, they are obviously all going to be as uh, capable as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum in terms of their colors and their resolution. So, uh, of course, that would be the other two big 68,000-based machines that came out uh, right after the Macintosh, being the Commodore Amiga 1000 and the Atari 520ST. And you didn't really see the IBM PC line uh, really start to catch up with the Amiga and the ST uh, until the 90s when you had these 3D6 based machines with uh, Sound Blaster, AdLib type cards in them, and of course VGA graphics when that became more of a standard thing. And that's when DOS gaming really started taking off. But uh, in the middle of all that, at the beginning of the Macintosh era, uh, the Apple II computers never went away until the early 90s. And in fact, you could get an Apple IIe uh, as late as like 1994. You could still go buy one brand new. But that wasn't the most advanced model in the Apple II line. Of course, that was the Apple II GS, which was a, really a 16-bit computer. It had a uh, 65816 in it, just like the Super Nintendo, but it came out several years before the Super Nintendo. And there was a, a pretty decent amount of software that came out for the 2GS. In fact, it was uh, really uh, hitting that same mark that the Amiga and the ST were in terms of its graphical and sound capabilities, which is what the G and S stand for in Apple 2GS. But Apple never really got behind it and basically just let it peter out by the early 90s. And uh, as a result, you had this uh, sort of third machine in that class that just gave up its ghost as the IBM PCs with VGA start coming out and completely taking over. So we're going to see how all four of these machines do that same basic program, more or less uh, modified to fit their systems and their particular interpreters, and how they can do that original like ZX Spectrum lowest common denominator Mandelbrot set plot. And uh, we'll see how fast they get, who, who will be the fastest of these to do that thing that uh, some of our modern 8-bit computers like the Commander X16 can do very quickly. Will it be able to be faster than that? that that'll be a really interesting thing to see. And then, of course, after that, we'll, like we did in the last uh, series for the 8-bit computers, we'll have round two, which will be doing assembly implementations of these. I'm not planning at this point on doing an assembly implementation for the TI-994A. Uh, I don't know anything about that processor <laughs> in terms of its instruction set architecture. It's not very well documented, or at least... The, the documentation is not widespread and it is uh, not exactly a processor that a lot of folks are doing development on compared to all of these others and the resources are going to be a lot smaller and frankly i have extremely uh, little faith <laughs> that the ti-994a is going to compete with any of these other machines in, in the 16-bit era so we're going to be focusing on uh, creating a uh, pc version uh, still sticking with the cga graphics for 8086 uh, of course, the text-based graphics, so we have full 16 colors. And then creating a, a 68,000 
implementation of the algorithm, which will thankfully be able to reuse heavily between the, the Mac, the Amiga, and the ST, and just have to do some of the special graphics uh, things and uh, API calls. And then for the 2GS, uh, we'll have the original 6502, implementation of this algorithm for of course the bbc micro and the commander x16 and the commodore 64 and all of these uh, we'll be able to take that uh that code and that'll be a much easier lift to just get that into the 816 instruction set architecture where we can replace a lot of the math with 16-bit math operations instead of the 8-bit math operations and we're going to see just how much more performance we get out of that especially since a lot of the code is going to be uh, pretty much the same as it was for the 6502. So that'll be, I think, pretty interesting. And uh, I really have no idea at this point who's going to be fastest. Is the AT really going to be faster than the rest of these? It was certainly far more expensive. And uh, I'd say that Apple uh, price to performance ratio was also certainly extremely high. H how's it going to really come out when we're dealing with just straight up math? It, I think it'll be a very interesting series of videos to come. And, and, and just uh, I'll be getting these out, you know, uh, every other week or so. It, I think it should be pretty interesting. But then the, I think the really great potential that we have with this 16-bit Battle Royale is we can take it quite a bit further than the 8-bit Battle Royale. We generally have more capable machines, again, other than the Mac where you don't have color, but you still do have pretty high resolution, is that we can do a quote-unquote high resolution plot and be able to really get some nice graphics in there. And certainly with the PCAT, you'd have EGA graphics available. Meanwhile, of course, for the Amiga and the ST and the 2GS, you also had a very good color capability, and you could go uh, well beyond 16 colors also. Um, though we'll probably start initially just with that 16 colors, but doing it at that higher resolution, and maybe just taking it from there. And with these machines that had the, the higher color capability, how can they do something even better than 15 colors? Can we get something like really impressive the, coming out of these old machines? And, and I, I think we can. I think we can take these machines, even when they were strictly 16-bit, I think we could take them very far. And now let's uh, move on to uh, the other big series. That's something that's been uh, even more popular than I had expected is my $32 FPGA board series uh, where I, I have this cheap Chinese Altera board. Uh, it's a development board with an Altera Cyclone 4 on it, and it, it's working. Uh, I've got it up and working, and now I'm just trying to get all these different components all figured out to make sure that they're all working, that I can uh, program them and come up with uh, custom hardware definitions that will make it do the things I need it to do, which would be namely get them all working together to create a single board computer. It's not going to be anything close to a Raspberry Pi or even a Commander X16 for that matter. It's going to have to be an extremely simple computer. But I, I do need to have uh, certain components on it working to get the desired effect. Now, the easiest thing to do, of course, the little lights. <laughs> I got the blinking lights demo working no problem. I got the LEDs and the digit tube uh, working on there, and everything is looking fine. And of course, there's the buttons too. The buttons are the easiest input on there. They're directly on board, and yeah, they, they work great. I can push the button. I can see the button. I can make uh, lights or whatever, do something different based on those buttons. And so yeah, that the buttons are all working great. Uh, I can program them, no problem. Uh, the next more complicated thing, of course, would be the VGA output. And we saw that in my last video as I was able to get the VGA output to work on my monitor. And it, it's working pretty well. I'm getting eight colors out of it right now uh, because I really just have a uh, three bit <laughs> color. I'm going to maybe do some more experiments with the output of there and, and try to get some sort of in-between states. So maybe I could make each color component be something in between zero and one. We'll, we'll see. And then uh, what I have tested since, and, and we'll be getting some video of that in another episode, is the RS-232 port. 
And uh, of course, that is your standard serial port. You could connect it to a teletype machine. And at the very least, if I had a CPU core running on here and all the attending computer business, I could uh, just hook it up through the DUART that's uh, already on the uh, development board and just uh, do everything through that port and be able to type and I, I verified I can type and receive uh, the text data coming uh, in from the port and then I can spit text back out and it goes back out uh, onto a, a terminal so uh, having a terminal based machine like the original Altair it, it, it could actually work it, it would definitely be something that I can create with this FPGA board at the very least and uh, of course is the most simplest uh, because that's how original computers were and that and there's a good reason for it. it was very easy to create that to have a built-in display adapter is a lot more difficult but I've got the display part more or less figured out I'm going to have a lot of work to do in terms of defining how that display is going to be but then if I'm not using the RS-232 port uh, for a strictly a terminal connection, I'm going to need a keyboard. And of course, there's a PS2 port on there. And that's where things are <laughs> not working so great so far. Uh, I've got a PS2 a keyboard that I've hooked up to it, and I'm just having a real difficult time getting that uh, FPGA board to to see anything other than a test code come up on there. It, it doesn't seem like anything's working. So uh, I'm starting to get to the point where uh, just experimenting with the Verilog code to see if I can, you know, send control codes to the keyboard or try to read things in a different way, I, I, I'm really playing blind here without being able to see how the, the clock and signal timings uh, sort of line up and to make sure that when I'm uh, typing on the keyboard that I'm getting a, a signal that looks a certain way and that within my hardware when I am trying to send say a reset command to the keyboard or to turn on one of the uh, little uh, indicator lights on the keyboard is that actually working properly and, and I, I have to be able to really see what those waveforms are looking like to make sure that the timing that I'm building up within my Verilog code is valid. So for that of course, I'm going to need an oscilloscope. Well, I don't have my own personal oscilloscope. I've always de depended on my school or employer to provide one for me. And these days, of course, I'm home all the time and I don't have... <laughs> I don't have my own scope, and uh, I don't th think I'm going to get anybody to just give me a scope to work with because nobody's paying me other than you fine folks who are uh, patronizing my uh, YouTube channel or, or going straight on Patreon. And, of course, we'll talk more about that later. If I'm, anybody's going to be paying for this scope, it's going to be me, and so that's what I did. I went ahead and bought a new oscilloscope, and we're going to take a look at that unboxing right now. All right, no need to pretend a hand model. We know exactly what's coming. This bad boy right here. <laughs> this is, of course, a nice new digital oscilloscope from the fine folks at Handtech. Of course, it's a Chinese company uh, that is uh, selling low-cost oscilloscopes to the international market, but they're not really like a uh, bargain basement kind of a uh, dodgy sort of operation they're they're providing it's a low cost option that works reasonably well so uh, a lot of good reviews on this item and it's not super highly featured it's not going to help with modern computers that have uh, super high bus frequencies. This is a 100 megahertz uh, scope and is going to do just fine on my 50 megahertz FPGA board in which most stuff I'm running in the kilohertz range. So that's going to be perfectly fine. I don't even need to see the, uh, the base clock signal all that clearly. If it shows up as a sine wave, that is A-OK. -okay. So let's, let's see what's going on in here. Now, it just got shipped right here in the box. Did not come any sort of external box. <laughs> and it's uh, not even uh, taped so much. So who knows who's been into this? <laughs> I don't know if the guy that runs the truck is trustworthy. But here we go. 
we got our uh, standard uh, US power cable. That's good to see. Ooh, we got a mini uh, CD right in here with an official looking Hantex certification. And then, oh, we've got the good stuff here. We've got our probes. So we've got one probe in here. And looks like, yeah, and here's a second probe. So we got two probes. Some of these low cost scopes may have two inputs, but only come with one probe. This thankfully comes with two. Let's see, we got all the other little goodie bags out here. And now we've got, oh, look at all these extra fun little parts. Some extra jumpers and other little probey things. We'll get into all of that bag of tricks soon enough. But just a bunch of neat little parts. Like this is obviously something that's made for hobbyists. Uh, if I was running a real engineering firm and had a YouTube channel, I would probably not be buying something uh, this uh, simple and inexpensive. But for my purposes, it works out just fine. I think that's it. Yep, nothing left to bring out except for the main unit. And here it is. Looks exactly as it did online. I know there's uh, some versions that have, uh, it doesn't have this shade of blue on these insets, but otherwise, no, they're the same. Let's let it out of its little plastic shell. And there we go. There it is little inventory of what we got here. We got this nice size display. Ooh, do we have a little thing to peel? Oh yeah. Watch out. Normally I'd save this for my OnlyFans. So here we go. Oh yeah. Peeling right off, very nice. We've got here, we've got a, a USB port. I know that uh, you can take waveform captures that uh, are stored on the internal memory. It does not have very much internal memory at all. You're not gonna be able to store a bunch of stuff. It's pretty much gonna be a one-shot deal. So you could save off these different plots uh, to a USB drive. And I think this is also how you can get different uh, firmware on here. Because also my understanding is that what you get with this the actual hardware in here from all these different model variants that they're all pretty much the same the same sort of inputs and they just have like different labels up here because i think a lot of the changes are purely within the firmware and you could reprogram this to work differently like i understand it may even be possible here like this external trigger uh, i could make this into a function generator instead and it, i would just have to sacrifice some of the other normal features in here because uh, generally what well, you would have obviously you got the trigger that's uh, strictly an input so you can uh, trigger off uh, i could have that set on the on the clock so on the edge of the actual clock or a divided clock and then i'd have the two probes that i could connect and actually plot up here on the screen all these nice uh, digital controls, a lot of uh, like this auto set here. It can help you find the trigger and it will let you get the, the best possible looking plot based on, uh, uh, on sort of the, the range and the frequency of what it's seeing. But of course, and it's all, all can be changed here. We can move waveforms up and down, uh, make them uh, you know, taller or shorter. And then, of course, uh, move back and forth in time. So basically, say your trigger edge is here. We can make it off the screen over here, however you want to do it. So, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, fire this boy up and, and see what it can do. All right, got it plugged in. Let's turn it on. Nice colored lights. <laughs> Everything can comes on. Oh, we got a QR code. Hantech is my testing solution provider. All right, and we have nothing but noise as expected. So let's take a look. So what we can see here in this probe, of course we got the probe itself, that's pretty standard. And then here, these little colored rings that as you can see here, this probe comes with a little red ring. And that can help us keep track of which probe is which. Because we can see here we have a, 
a matching color ring here on the end that's going to connect to the scope and then this one here at the business end basic bnc connector here for the scope we're gonna plug this in all right and there we go all right so now of course if you don't know how scopes work generally you're going to have this little alligator clip here it is going to have to go on some sort of common ground and uh, then this guy is going to get the actual signal here so our what we have here is a a reference uh, generator here you can see it says it's five volts at one kilohertz so i can do the alligator clip on the bottom and then hook my probe into the top. And there I can see, look at that. Oh, you know what? Here's a, here's a good feature just for this unboxing, little feet. <laughs> All right, so here, let's uh, auto set. What's it gonna look like? There we go. <laughs> so now we've got, uh, got that all set and we're going to want to do a little uh, calibration here. So, of course, in the little bag of goodies here, we have, of course, those colored rings. And then we have this little calibration tool right here. So we can fix these little ends that are kind of a uh, little pointy. So what we can do is bitter calibration tool down in there you see i go clockwise and it gets worse but i go counterclockwise it squares up real nice and i can even try maybe blowing that up and i can still see it's a little off can i get it even tighter there even zoomed way in where it has a hard time triggering yes i can all right so now i will get that back down to a, uh, a decent size. So we can see the other probe too. It comes with the red rings by default. So we're gonna switch those out. Now I, I'm not colorblind, so these uh, green ones will contrast for me pretty nicely. All right, now we've got nice green. We're ready for Christmas here, red and green. <laughs> so we'll get greeny connected here on channel two. There we go. Now, I think we'll have to disconnect our French channel one from there. That should be fine. Now let's get channel two connected. So channel one will just still be cruising at doing nothing. But now we got channel two, so let's get channel two up there. There we go. And we'll do another auto set on that. And let's zoom in on him. And there, now we can see how way far off <laughs> that calibration is. So let's fix that up. Oh, nope. Again, counterclockwise is what we want. I think I went a little too far. All right, now we'll zoom that back out and push him back down a bit. And there he goes. So, looks like we've got uh, two uh, pretty nice probes going here. Let's see if we can get both probes up at once. So, first I'm gonna take channel two off and we'll see if I can get both of these guys have their grounds clipped to the bottom. Yeah. All right. And then I will get channel one. That's right. One is red <laughs> and two is blue. Now, of course, here we have an auto set again. Uh, even though we've got the same signal coming into channel one, I'll hit auto set again. And it should automatically detect that we're getting measurements on both channels. And there we go. All right, we'll get that off there. And now I can say I will 
move them a little closer together. Maybe say I want channel one to look a little higher, but I can make channel two. And <laughs> now they're interfering with each other and I'll separate them out a bit. So there we go. We've got a working scope here. Not too shabby. So uh, I think the next time we'll see this scope in action is uh, when instead of just seeing uh, just boring square waves, we're going to see the, the two parts of the PS2 signal that we care about, which is the clock and the data. And uh, both, neither of them are strictly periodic. In fact, you can have um, both of them be bidirectional. And uh, of course, generally with these PS2 devices like a keyboard, you are mostly just sending from the keyboard out. And the same with the mouse, you're sending it from that remote device to the host. But uh, especially with a keyboard, you want to do things like turn on the caps lock key or uh, run a test or something. So we want to make sure that we have communication going both ways working with our keyboard because it's not working with the built-in demos that I got off the internet. And I'm going to have to debug those and really get my PS2 keyboard to work. And so that'll be the next time this guy makes an appearance. And that should be coming real soon. But the main thing is, is to really thank the patrons and all, even the folks who are just uh, subscribing and watching on YouTube and uh, just enjoying the ads that they're watching, <laughs> or even if they're YouTube premium subscribers. It all helps just the engagement with my channel, and but especially the support on Patreon or joining as a member on YouTube. It really makes me acquiring things like this and being able to do projects that are more than uh, just uh, coding up a few things on open source software possible. What if I go back uh, two years before I had any patrons, uh, it was because I, I didn't have very good content on my channel. And in fact, uh, I didn't even have any tutorial uh, videos until February 22nd of 2020. At that point, I had a bunch of demos where I didn't speak on them at all. It was just uh, straight up run the demo off the computer. If it was a Commander X16 demo, which I pretty much all of them were at that point, it was just going to uh, take the sound that was coming out of that X16 emulator. I was not recording any of my own voice to go with them. But once I built my XCI game engine, I needed to uh, sort of explain what it was and, and how it worked. So my very first video that was not just a demo, that was an actual tutorial, kind of like how I make now, was this one, XCI Game Development. And what we're going to see now are uh, a few uh, clips of this video that I've already shared in whole to my patrons. So if you're a member of the channel by clicking join or uh, part of our Patreon community, you can go ahead and see that entire uncut video right now. But I'll give you a little taste uh, just for everybody to see uh, some of the kind of things that I can share exclusively with the patrons of my channel. So here's my version of a reaction video. People like reaction videos, especially for uh, for YouTubers' uh, very first video. Well, my very first video wasn't really made for YouTube, but it got put on YouTube. And this is a lot of video projects that I had done years in the past, and they eventually did family movies. But in terms of my current incarnation of the channel with uh, all the retro content, yeah, as you can see, this is an hour and 11 minutes. Yeah, I mean, of course, nothing more uh, entrancing than looking at a GitHub page. This was uh, very engaging content. Let's see. I do I actually get to something different? And, uh, a bunch of files so beautifully here, awkward. Readme uh, dot markdown, which uh, you can see. By the way, this was just is the, the main uh, over two here. years ago, February twenty second, twenty twenty. Go through everything you can see here. I'll sort of skim through that right there. So I think that's really important to uh, to point out is that I've only been doing videos like this for about twenty six months. And at the time that I put this video out, I had uh, very, very few followers. It was probably still well under 100 followers. <laughs> yeah, things have definitely come a long way. But again, I, I like for some reason, 
I, I didn't think that I needed to zoom in on anything. All this text is so small and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's not good and I apologize. Other special perks. You know, and you can see also at this time, I was not doing any editing for the videos. I was uh, kicking on the screen capture and just letting it run, doing all in one take, no editing, and and not really looking back on the video. I want to make it very clear, uh, and especially you can tell from my uh, vlog type videos, that I, I don't always speak very mellifluously. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always know exactly what I want to say at any given time. So I'll do a lot of, uh, mm, uh, and there's, and as much as it gets into the final cuts of these videos, you'll see it's, it's a lot. And at least these days I, I have the good sense to cut that out or at least take a pause, collect my thoughts and then start again. So I can take out these little more awkward bits <laughs> and make things a bit, a bit more polished. Notice right here in the, the title bar, Commander X16, 80%. So this was on my old laptop. It was a, a very old laptop. I believe it was vintage 2011. And I was using it in 2020 still. And yeah, it could only run the Commander X16 emulator at 80% of its normal speed. So yeah, I wasn't doing <laughs> a whole lot of benchmarks at that point with, uh, <laughs> with this machine. And my XCI tutorial series that followed this, like I, I did a couple episodes before COVID hit, but then at the end I'd start actually sort of referencing. It's like, hey, you're stuck inside. Let's do some of this development. And, and it really started... I think even though those videos were still some of my least watched videos on my channel, that it really set the template for what I was doing, it made me realize that like this is more of the kind of content that I need to make. And uh, it wouldn't be too long after doing that uh, by the end of 2020 that I got started to get really serious about making tutorial videos. All right. I hope you liked that one too. Uh, I think we had some interesting things today, even though we didn't have any, uh, any big demos happening, but we're going to have uh, plenty more of that to come. So for now, let's uh, take a look at our Patreon <laughs> folks. And there we are. These are the, these are the folks who uh, made that scope possible. The, and also the folks that get to see some of this extra content that's exclusive for them, like these uh, uh, uncut reaction videos and even some things like the unboxing. These folks get to see all of that stuff uh, ahead of time and ad free. And if you want to get in on that, the best way to do that is to go to our Patreon which is uh, linked uh, in the description and of course here on the screen or you can click that join button if you just want to do it on youtube but definitely uh, patreon is where most of my hardcore fans are and uh, also with on patreon you'll get a, a link to my uh, discord uh, which I, i'm starting to really evolve especially now that i've got the the podcast going so uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes if you want to get in on that uh, just hit me up and uh, I'll, I'll see you there. Otherwise, just please you know, like, comment, and subscribe to this video. Just subscribing on YouTube is 100% free, as always. And uh, if you click on that bell to be notified when the next video comes out, you're going to see all the stuff I was talking about in this video the second I get it out there on YouTube for everybody to see. All right? I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.